for a few weeks now, um, I've been sort of wrestling with rest because I am, that's my daughter over there, Cassidy. Yeah, so, 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 um, so Cassidy has, uh, she sort of got me onto thinking a lot about rest lately because I've, um, doing what I do, I run around a lot. Man. I do a lot. So yesterday, I did, for example, yesterday, I did three funerals yesterday. Three, um, yeah, two of our boys who were killed on the Cape Flats, um, one died of an overdose, and then I was part of that. He was 18 years old. That's a sad story. And so, so that sort of stuff moves me to, to sort of always want to run and just be there for everybody. But in doing that, we sometimes forget that there's people in our lives that sort of God put in our lives and gave us that we should be sort of taken care of. And so a few, about two months ago, Cassidy, Cassidy wrote me a letter. And yeah, she wrote me a letter telling me of what she thinks I should be doing. Because I love golf, but I hardly play golf because I'm always running around and doing things. And Cassidy said to me, um, this is what I, I just think you, you're doing too much. And a uh, few months prior to that, my mentor started teaching me about this principle called um, Zim Zam. So I'm going to be about that. Zim Zam. It's the principle of rest and the rhythm. I listened to Jason when he spoke over here when you said you wanted to change the key. It's that type of thing. Because sometimes our life can be a beautiful song or it can be just a lot of noise. And if you change the keys when you're supposed to, you get the beautiful song. But if you continue for too long, it becomes noise. And so, so your life is supposed to be in perfect balance and perfect rhythm of that. Rest and rhythm, it should be that. So this morning, if you have a Bible here, you can turn with to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. It's the topic of rest and rhythm. So the writer of Hebrews is giving some implications of the cross of Jesus Christ. He addresses forgiveness of sins and no more sacrificing. But I think there's a topic that, that I just that, that we don't we don't put too much press on this topic. That's that one, rest in the rhythm. So in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says this. Can I go? He says this: There remaineth therefore Sabbath rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest, that no man fall after the same example of disobedience. So to the writer of Hebrews, a failure to live with some intentional rest leads us to some sort of life of, of disrepair. So you can either set your life in, in life, light, and increase, or death, darkness, and decrease. And so if you choose to intentionally set a place of rest, you will move in light, life, and increase. It's like Deuteronomy. I said before your life and death, choose life. Life, light, increase, death, darkness, and decrease. It's, we choose where we want to go with this. And rest to the right of Hebrews, he's saying, look at your rest is so, so important to move in that realm of, of light and increase. And if we don't do it, our life will find it will, it will move into a disrepair. And so, um, so, so before we break this down, we must ask ourselves this question. When, when any book you read, you ask yourself three questions. Who's writing the scripture? Who's he writing it to? And how would the people of that day interpret what's being said to them? So who's writing the scriptures? I don't know, wrote Hebrews, anyone else know? I don't know. The religions wrestle with it all the time. No one knows, we don't know. It sounds like what, but nobody knows. I think, I think Hebrews was written, there's lots of stuff in the book of Hebrews that is just far-fetched. He just makes grace too big. So ever easy was clever at the time, not saying, because they'd kill you for that sort of thing in those days. And so, so we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Who is he writing to? He's writing to the Hebrew people who were a group of slaves at that time, right? So he's writing to slaves. So then, how was this interpreted? How was it interpreted? In the first century, there was a thing called the law of first mention, right? So whatever was mentioned first, whatever, whatever came after that, we'd go back to that again. So where was the mention of, of rest mentioned first? It was in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 it says this, And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God finished his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and he hallowed it. Hallowed simply means make something bigger. The word zagiyazo, it means to make something much bigger. 
So he hallowed it because that in that he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So the first mention of rest is this. And then it says, and God hallowed it. He made this day so, so big. But I think we sort of make it small. And so if God is hallowing something, I think we should be hallowing it too. Rest. Later, this God in Hebrews now that we spoke of in Genesis, he frees a group of slaves. Bearing in mind, this group of slaves were in slavery for more, more than 430 years. We say 400, as theologians will teach 430, but it's more, it's like 432, somewhere around there. So it's 400, more than 400 years, more than, more, more than 430 years, they're in slavery. And God comes and he frees them. He frees them. He says, look at you. Now, um, you're not going, he sets new rules in place. He says, look at you, for now, um, you, you, you can't, there's a Sabbath I set for you. On the seventh day, you will rest. To a group of slaves, they're not thinking, hey, this is the law, like we say, when you read the Ten Commandments, this is the law. No, no, no. They're saying that our forefathers were slaves. They've worked. They've never had a day off in 430 years. So for them, this is grace. It's grace. And God sets this thing in motion for them to say, look at you, this is how you're going to conduct yourself now. No longer will you work, 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 because your life isn't determined by what you do. It's determined by who you are. And, um, and, and there's something that, that last week when, when, when I was here, something that Bradley said when you were speaking. Can I talk about your stories? Okay, I didn't, I didn't ask you. But anyway, so I, I, last week when you were over here, I was thinking, listen to your story, and you said something about um, your, your, you and your wife, and you're talking about the whole thing. And now you were work, 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 ministry, 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 and, and what it did to you. Because you see, if you continue living a life where you feel your worth is determined by what you do, you're going to do, 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 and the people that God had entrusted you with, they're going to get hurt. They're going to get hurt. And so your relationship, which is way bigger than I think most of the things we put in our, in our daily living, should be that union of oneness that God instituted, marriage. And so you protect that above all costs, but you won't because you feel that we have to do. God had called me for ministry. I have this massive calling on my life. I can't neglect this calling because it's a big deal. And that's how we love. We do. I, th I think we take ourselves way too seriously sometimes in ministry. We do. We think that we, if I'm not going to be there, Jesus is, I'm, I'm, look at it, nothing's going to happen. Like, I mean, I must be there. That's why some mornings I feel like I'm, on a Wednesday, some guy walk in there, I'm coming, I come later, I'm sorry, I'm, I was busy. I like I had to wash tackies or something. <laughs> you, know, that you, you must do things, I mean, and so, so yes, anyway. So, you see, if, if, you, if your life becomes so busy, so busy and noisy, and out of control, the very people in your life, like I said, are going to suffer that God entrusted you with. You see, he's called us to rest. And if we neglect that, everything else runs into disrepair. Everything. There's this rhythm that God speaks of. It's a, the six and one rhythm. Six days on, one day off. And you have to have that in perfect balance. You have to, a mastery of that will get you into a successful life. But once you run, 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 run all the time, mm -mm, you're going to become like a clanging bell. Your life's going to be noisy. The very people in your life are going to be hurt because of your noisy life. You can either be a person whose life is still and quiet and not just blowing a gasket. If you're married in this room today, you know what I'm speaking about. You work all day, as ah, not me. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, you know if you're married. If you work all day and you come home in the evenings and somebody says the slightest thing to you that you just, you know what happens, poof, blow a gasket. That people with temporary clients today, this is a permanent love of your life who's bearing a blunt for something that happened at work today. Is that right? It's wrong. It's wrong. So I'm not saying be lazy. I'm not saying don't go to work. I'm saying six and one, six and one. Work six days, rest. I mean, if you look at this thing, the, if, if you look at Genesis and you read chapter two, go through that home and read it. If God honored it, I mean, he's God. It says that he rested. Does God need to rest? I mean, he's God. Does he need to, does God ever get tired? The Bible says he never slumbers nor sleeps. I mean, does he get tired? No, it doesn't. So then why would it be that important for him to just take an one day off? One day off. 
You see, the principle of Zimzam, it was first spoken of in the book called the Zohar. Now, the Zohar is not a pagan thing, guys. Don't look at me like that. It's not a pagan thing. The Zohar was a book that was written by Abram. It was predated, it's predated scripture, Jewish scripture, right? So it was written by Abram. Father Abram had many sons. That Father Abram, he wrote it, right? Um, it's, uh, there's a book in there called the Book of Formations. So in Formations, he speaks of this principle called Zimzam. It's where, it's, uh, the word Zimzam, the Hebrew, the root word means to get smaller, to contract. And so, so what they felt and they knew was that if you get smaller, then everything else around you get bigger. So, so sometimes, sometimes, if you married, you know, for your wife to thrive, you sometimes must get smaller. And for your most ones, for wives, I think, your wife gets smaller, <laughs> so your husband can thrive, so he can be, you know what I mean? I'm not married, I can say this stuff. So don't say that if you're married, no, it's trouble. So anyway, but it's that sort of thing. If you're in ministry, you know as a ministry leader, sometimes you must get smaller so that your team, so that they can thrive and so they can get the credit. If, you, if, you, if you're involved in anything, I think, there's a time where you need to sort of just contract, get smaller. You see, when we get smaller, whatever's around us gets bigger. And so if you're saying we're caring for somebody for something, we called to be smaller sometimes but most times there's big shots all around us all around us i always say this i always say this that and please don't quote me on this one but um this is just close to my heart i just think that that for for too long we've, we've we make people big shots there's too much big shots around i just feel in church especially there's all those big shot preachers and everybody wants to do a big shot. But I think we had a big shot over 2,000 years ago and he put himself on a cross for everybody and that, that's as big as it gets. So, so, so why do we still need to be, I, I like we chatted earlier, we, just love. Be nice, love God, love people and be nice and realize it is not about you. Don't take yourself that serious. I think sometimes in ministry we often take ourselves like we think if, if we're not gonna be there, the whole thing will fall apart. And that's very, very wrong. I think it's very, very wrong. If you look at Jesus' take on this whole thing, in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 17, it says this, But they themselves have no root, and they remain for only a season. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others are like seeds sown among the thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word out. And becomes unfruitful the worries of this life I mean Jesus that's Jesus right mark in essence what he says is look at your stop looking around at other people's things and at stuff and at, at, at trying to make a life better stop 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 that whole thing the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth that chokes the life out of you that chokes the life out of you and so so for us I think what's important of you is, is looking at that and realizing that oftentimes it's not so much sin. A sin is a, a sin, sin's a, a term that, 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 that's used in archery. It means to miss the mark. I think we all miss the mark every single day, every single one of us. So, so it's not so much missing the mark that matters. But in this context, in this context, it's more about it's more not being able to be here and fully be here. What is of this life is being here, but you're being somewhere else. And oftentimes we find ourselves in that way. Like you can be here, like if this was a sun, if this was now next Sunday, I'd be here, but I think in his Hamilton gonna win the Grand Prix. That's 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 the what is this life? It is. That's what it is. That speaks of that. That's about being present in this room, but my head is what about Monday morning's meeting? That's the what is this life? That's the what is this life. And so sometimes you must always look at that sort of thing. Where where are, am I fully in this moment? Where is my head somewhere else? Because that's what Jesus calls the worries of this life. Oftentimes, he's given us so much, but we're chasing and pursuing so much more. And the people in our life suffer because of that. You get people who work and work and work, and they're saying they're giving their kids a better life. I have a very, very close friend of mine. Use the name, so it's okay. Maybe Cassidy will, but, but he's just, I mean, his son is three years old. And he's left to go work for three years now in another country. And I said to him, like, he asked me, what's his, I, said, I said, dude, like, I mean, that makes no sense. He's going to be six when he gets back. He said, yeah, but we can Skype. 
but I'll give him a better life. I said, now for me, I don't know. That's just my view again. I just think that that, that makes no sense. It's, it's, it's chasing and pursuing and thinking I need more and more and more. And that, once we get into that motion of just chasing and chasing and chasing, it's the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth. That's why Jesus says chokes the life out of us. Choking the life. There are days when we must sit down and realize that I have enough. I'm going to spend time with my daughter or with my son, or I'm just going to go kick it and go. There's days when I just go on a, on a Wednesday now, it's like my day. Like I do nothing on the Wednesdays. Phone me, I couldn't phone me now. I missed the next morning, I said, I, 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 phone on just low one side. I didn't look at it. So I, I just didn't look at it. I just, because sometimes if some people's close to your heart, so you'll see the message and you will look at it. So I don't do that. I just don't look at the phone at all. Because there's days when you might just go eat a white ball. Like, I mean, there's days you take this white ball, put it in your bag, and just go smack that ball. It's the greatest thing in this world. It's refreshing. It's very refreshing to do that. You do stuff that sort of work for you, yeah. Like this amazing little ball that this guy's invented. Yo, it's magic. I love it. And so, um, yeah, yo, it's, uh, that's crazy. Yo, it's amazing what it does for me. Because, you know, that, that's the one thing I find that refreshes me so, so much, golf. It's magic. I don't know. At the, yo. It is. Anyone who plays, you will know. Like, I mean, it's magic. You don't understand this thing. And so, yeah, so for me, I do that on a Wednesday. I'll just go play and go eat the white ball. And so, yeah, so, so, so that's that. So that's the, the, the what, so, so what's the cure for the thorns that, that Jesus speaks about here? The cure is Sabbath. It's having a day where you choose to intentionally, and, and I say again, intentionally, not, not, okay, I'm going to do it today. No, there has to be a day set aside that this is the day I'm actually going to do nothing. If it's a Wednesday, if it's a Thursday, if it's a Friday, whatever day it is to you, that's the day, sit down and do nothing. Choose to intentionally and do nothing other than what you actually feel like doing to refresh your soul. To refresh your soul. It's a day when you remind yourself that you're not a machine and God, not, God does not determine your worth by what you accomplish, but by who you are, by who you are. So um, in Mark chapter 132 verse 40, it says this. This is Jesus, no? This is Jesus. Check this. If Jesus is taking this, this seriously. That evening of the sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew, because they knew who he was. Verse 35, this part I love. Very early in the morning while it was dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. So Jesus wakes up, goes to a place where nobody knows. He goes. We prayed. Simon and his, com and his companions went to, to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. That, that's, that happens. I mean, if you're healing, casting out demons, healing people, who's going to look for you, right? It's a big deal. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. Like, how cold is that? That's Jesus. Hey, look at that. They're looking for you, Jesus. You must heal people. Ah, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> so, so if Jesus doesn't take himself that seriously in that context, I mean, why do we? Why do we put so much pressure on our lives? Then it says he went to a nearby village and we could do the same thing over there. In other words, yeah, I know his people over here, but let's go somewhere else. He first goes to a solitary place. He hides away, basically. You know, there's a, in, I think it's in, in Luke, there's, there's one story, which says he actually, there's, there's a few stories that Jesus does this sort of thing, right? In Luke, it says he actually goes to a graveyard at night. I'm thinking, how desperate are you to run away from people? Like, I mean, if Jesus, I'm like, looking for you, Jesus, no, no, let's go to the graveyard, hang out here at night. I'm going to sit in the graveyard. Right? I mean, just to get away from people. And sometimes we must do that. Sometimes you might just get away and go to a place where you can be refreshed and be restored and, and that's, that's important because, because if, you, if you don't do that, your life is going to spill over. It's like you were talking, you know, I think it's the Wednesday thing you're speaking of. That's that. You, your life is going to spill over like, like water onto people and, and what's spilling onto them. Whatever's on your life is going to fall onto them, those close to you. So if you're angry all the time, the people in your world's going to be angry. If you're anxious and worried all the time, people in your life, that's what they're going to pick up from your life. You see, it's like kind of like a, a bottle of water. If water is filled halfway, a bottle, right? And you shake that. What, what it's turbulent, it's, it's, it's crazy, it's turbulent. But if the water's full to the top and you shake it, it's less. It's less. And so, so the word there for, for, um, 
for where was I now? I was going somewhere. But but so so with a bottle, right? A water bottle. Once you have that thing full to the top, your life then becomes more beneficial to those around you. Instead of all shaky, all empty. And so 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 for us to restore a soul, right? The word for restored soul, I think the word is um, for soul is vanish. And then for for restored soul as my inner fish. And so when David writes things, he restored my soul, he leads me to still waters. It's that, this principle he's speaking about. He's speaking about something that says, look at you, when I'm laying beside still waters, it's that where God needs to lead me into. God needs to lead me to a place of rest where my soul can be restored again. My inner fish. That's the word. And so for us here this morning, I think a lot of us need to look at that and realize that, that the people in our life matter. The people God has entrusted to us, have matter. they matter. It's not so, so just, just about my life. It's about, it's, about, it's about me being restored and refreshed and coming to a place of understanding when I pour that out to people, that's what I'm giving them. Because if I'm angry all the time, or if, uh, Cassidy moaned with me, or what, what did she said to me, we used to drive the car. In the letter she said to me, uh, this is a bit of a cold one actually. She said to me, I'm daddy, I'm, and stop saying you're tired all the time. And, because I, when I fetch her, I'd say, yo, I'm tired, baby, I worked hard. That's, so she said, you need to stop saying that. And I'm thinking, hi, Cassidy, yo, it's a bitchy. But I wrote it in a letter. That's that. So I was spilling that over to her all the time. And I mean, and she's in school. I mean, imagine me throwing my tired life over to her all the time. That's not fair. That's not, that's not a cool daddy. It's better being a golfing daddy. It's a bitchy better. <laughs> Jesus is okay with that. And so, yeah, <laughs> it's true. So, um, so yeah, guys, so, so, so a few applications to this whole thing, right? Is the rhythm of your life sustainable? Is the rhythm of your life sustainable? Is it, is it properly, did you master that yet? Six and one. Or is it, I play too much, I play too much, and I have a ball of a time. Or is it, I work too much, I work too much. Which one is it? Or did you come to this understanding, look, I need to master this whole thing. I need to really, really, really work it. Because that's what God intends for us to do. To master the six and one rhythm. That for six days, we work, but on the seventh, we rest. I'm not saying do it on a Sunday, do it on a Monday. I'm not saying that. I'm saying find the one day and intentionally sit down and do what you feel refreshes and restores your soul. Do that. Find that one day. Set it aside. What is the better beat for your life? What's the better beat? Because sometimes things don't work. Sometimes things don't work for your life and you continue in that way. You continue because this is how it's said to be. But sometimes you need to sit down and change the rhythm. Change the rhythm. See what works for you. Um, do we know when to play and when to rest? Do we know when to play? Because think about this. If Jesus didn't work and go at it at, like he did for that three years, we would not have this gospel. So although he rested often, he went at it at some times as well, knowing he needed to rest also. But so, so do we know when to, to rest and do we know when to play? Um, what obviously needs to change for you to have a better life? For some people over here, we think that, look at you, maybe I just need to read more books. <laughs> for some people, maybe I need to eat more golf balls. For some people, I need to, yeah, I need to work. So, so what needs to change in your world? Because, because most times to get to that place of rhythm and rest, there's other things that's going to have to be not so important no more. Priorities will change to get that mastery, right? Um, you see, I was listening to, to, to Jason with the, when you, Robin did. Oh, yeah. Bradley, Bradley, yeah, Robin. When, when, you, when you said the key, the, the, the key, no? That whole thing. It's that, it's, it's, it's sometimes to get that thing right, you have to stop, in music especially. You can't sometimes go right back and change something, am I right? You have to stop the rhythm and you have to bring it back again. So there's, they call that gathering or something, right? So we must stop and we must gather again. Sometimes you've gone so far and you just can't come back. So when that happens, you stop and you gather. 
and then you go with it again. That's what you need to do. Five. Yeah. You need to do that. So, guys, um, rhythm and rest. Rhythm and rest. Exodus 23, it's the Sabbath laws. He speaks of this. He says, For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your, and, and your olive grove. Six days, you, six days you do your work, but on the seventh day you do not work, so that the ox and your donkey may rest, and so that your slave born in your household and the foreign living among you may be refreshed. It's not just for us. It's not just for us. I mean, it's, we don't have slaves, but I mean for the oxes, for the dogs in your house, for the cats around you. It's for everything to be refreshed. It's not just about us. It's about all of creation thriving when we set this principle of Zamzam -zam in place. When we get to the place of understanding that we need to sit down, we need to look at things around us and realize that this all works together. Six in one rhythm, six in one rhythm. Work and rest, work and rest, work and rest. Otherwise, not just our lives, but the lives around us are going to suffer as well. So this morning, I hope and I pray that um, when we look at our lives and we start to run out of steam, that we'll sit down and say, look at you, maybe the beat is wrong, I ran too far, I need to gather this, I need to gather this. Come to a place of understanding that when you fix your head under perfect flow of mastering that art of rhythm and rest, that the people around you, their lives are going to benefit from yours. That nafesh is important, but more important than nafesh, than my soul, is the inner fish, a restored and a refreshed soul. Because like that bottle of water, when it spills out, it's going to spill onto the people around you. May it be a refreshed soul that people get and not a noisy, clanging symbol. Okay? So this morning, guys, I hope that you were blessed by that. Um, that is uh, something that I feel God has um, really, really been dealing with me in my own life. In my own life. I need to just play golf. So when people call me a lazy, I say, no, nope. Jesus said I can do it. <laughs>